This video describes how to perform a lumbar ESP block for back pain and spine surgery. I've described the concept and relevant anatomy in another video, which is linked in the description. Briefly though, the aim is to anesthetize dorsal rami of the lumbar nerve roots. But just as importantly, at the same time, we want to minimize spread to the ventral rami of the nerve roots and the lumbar plexus, so as not to cause leg weakness or numbness. The division of the spinal nerve root into dorsal and ventral rami is closely related to the junction of the articular process and transverse process. The key here then is to land on the medial half of the lumbar transverse process and keep the spread superficial to the dividing fascia between the erector spinae muscle and the psoas muscle. Note that this is different from a lumbar ESP block that's performed for hip and lower limb analgesia, which I've also covered in a different video. This is the recommended basic equipment and supplies in adult patients. A curved probe is required for adequate imaging depth of the target and the wider field of view. The erector spinae muscle is much thicker in the lumbar region compared to the thoracic region. Similarly, a block needle of at least 80 to 100 millimeters in length is recommended. Bilateral blocks are needed in most back pain and lumbar spine surgery, and 20 milliliters of a long-acting local anesthetic per side in adults is generally adequate. Higher volumes in fascial plane blocks can increase efficacy, but may also result in an increased risk of side effects. In this case, motor block and possibly hypotension from epidural spread, and these may be occasionally seen with the higher volumes. Epinephrine should be added to reduce systemic absorption and prolong effect. Perineural or intravenous adjuncts such as dexamethasone can be administered to try and further prolong the duration of analgesia with single injection blocks. Now, catheter insertion with postoperative local anesthetic infusion has been described either preoperatively or at the end of the surgery by the surgeons, but for now, this remains a niche technique that will require the input and cooperation of your surgeons as well. Access to the back is required, and so patients must be placed in the sitting or prone positions. Either can be used for preoperative blocks in the awake patient. It's often most convenient, however, to perform the blocks after anesthetic induction and prone positioning for posterior spine surgery. There are two possible imaging and needling approaches to performing this block. The first is a parasagittal view of the transverse processes with an in-plane needle approach from either a cranial caudal or caudal cranial direction, depending on what feels most ergonomic. The second is a transverse view of the transverse process in the intertransverse plane between the erector spinae and psoas muscles, with an in-plane approach in a lateral to medial direction. In both cases, the endpoint for needle tip insertion is to land on the bony transverse process. This is not only an excellent tactile landmark, but also ensures that the needle tip remains superficial to the fascial boundary between erector spinae and psoas major muscle. As mentioned earlier, this reduces the risk of inadvertent lumbar plexus block and lower limb weakness. The parasagittal in-plane approach is the one that I tend to recommend as it's simpler and easier to learn. The finger-like projecting shadows of the transverse processes are visualized deep to the erector spinae muscle. An 80 to 100 millimeter needle is inserted to contact the target transverse process. The endpoint for local anesthetic injection is fluid spread superficial to the fascia that separates the two muscles. Often, this may appear to be somewhat intramuscular. However, this is acceptable as long as spread is seen occurring in a cranial caudal direction and generally lifting the muscle rather than just pooling within it. This is another example in which the target transverse process is T12 in a patient having a T12-L1 revision of their previous fusion. Again, the needle contacts the transverse process and local anesthetic is seen in a cranial caudal direction that creates a pocket that lifts the muscle up. A transverse in-plane approach is also possible. In this case, the articular process and transverse process are visualized, and the aim is to land on the medial half of the transverse process close to this junction, which is where the dorsal ramus emerges and branches out.
The endpoint for local anesthetic injection is spread between the erector spinae muscle and the transverse process. Note that this imaging plane is similar to that of the thoracolumbar interfascial plane or T-lip block. A parasitical scan shows local anesthetic spreading under erector spinae muscle but above the fascia separating it from psoas major muscle.